Okay, everybody, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, welcome to the Australian College of Physical Education and the Monday Night Coaches Club. My name is Gareth Long, and uh, we're really pleased to be back with what, what's our 20th um, episode. I, think, I don't know if you call a webinar an episode, but it's our 20th time of doing this. So uh, um, welcome back, everybody. Look, we, we, we know there are people in, in lockdown um, out there, and look, we, we hope wherever you are that you're all safe and well. And as always, we really appreciate you joining us um, for today's discussion, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Um, as always, use the chat function, introduce yourself, ask questions and answer other people's questions. Um, that really helps us get the interactivity um, um, going in this webinar. Drew is back helping me today. And uh, Drew, I think that cements your uh, a superior attendance record to Chris and Warren by some 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 margin now, but we 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 know that Chris and Warren have got good excuses not to be here today. But Drew is the player development manager at Football New South Wales and has an amazing ability to listen and write notes at the same time, which is the role that he'll be uh, doing for us today. Uh, good to see you again, Drew. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. Good to be here and really looking forward to uh, learning from these three. So look forward to it, mate. Cheers. Likewise, thanks, Drew. And joining myself and Drew will be Sean Darcy. It's the I think it's the third time that Sean's answered a, a um, um, early morning or actually that, that's pushing it a bit a late afternoon uh, message from me, seeing if he's available. So uh, uh, Sean will be monitoring the questions in the uh, chat function today. Um, Sean is an A licensed coach, ex pro freestyler, and owner of the Coach for Coaches. How are things going in uh, Western Australia, Sean? Uh, very very warm over here at the moment, uh, but hopefully we're, we've just gone into lockdown, but hopefully we're COVID free and we can stamp it out nice and quick. Good, hope so. I hope it's a short and sharp lockdown for you over there. Okay, on to today's topic and our panel, and it's another huge topic to, to dive into today. Um, and we're really hoping that we can provide an insight um, and potentially some support in how clubs analyse their teams, their players, and opposition and we're, we're really lucky to have three excellent panelists to help us to do this today so it's my pleasure to introduce them. Uh, I'm going to introduce first Richard Bredis. Richard is the first team performance analyst at Andelect having previously been the first team opposition analyst at Manchester City for six years. A former goalkeeper uh, with Lincoln City, Richard gained experience in performance analysis in Not with Nottingham Forest Ladies and at Reading before moving to Man City. Richard, thank you so much for giving up your time and joining us today. No, morning and evening, everyone, depending on where we are. Um, thanks for having me. Really looking forward to it. I think it's a great topic. And like you say, I think there's plenty for us to go out here this morning. So looking forward to it. Yeah, look, I'm trying to limit us to, to 90 minutes um, maximum. So um, I'll speak quickly um, and we'll, 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 we'll get on to you guys as quickly as possible. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, secondly, I'd like to introduce Andy Bowie. Andy is the lead under nines to under 16 performance analyst at Chelsea. In the last seven years, he has combined this role with that of academy coach, having previously been a coach and analyst at Barnet FC. Uh, Andy, good morning and thank you so much for joining us. Morning, no problem. Really looking forward to it. Like Richard said, it'd be good to, to chat, hopefully pick up a few things myself as well. Well, something I, I'm actually going to warn our panellists this in advance. Normally, I'll leave it right to the last moment, but there will be opportunity for you guys to ask each other a question as well later on. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're very keen that you guys get to pick each other's brains as well as us just picking your brains all the time. And, and uh, thirdly, I'd like to introduce Steve Jones. Steve is the first team opposition analyst lead scout for Cardiff City, having previously fulfilled a similar role at Millwall. An A-licensed coach, Steve has held other analysts, <laughs> analysis, I didn't know that was that difficult to say, and scouting roles at Rotherham, Nottingham Forest and Leicester City. Uh, Steve, great to have you along with us today. Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, looking forward to today um, and having a chat about our passion of football. Brilliant. Well, let me let me get um, started, and I'll start with you if that's okay, Richard. Because uh, this question, I, I suppose, when I first thought of an um, analysis, I, I thought of it being something that you know happened post game. But uh, I suppose there are things that you analyse during the game that is actually used during that game to try and support the coaching team and players. So, love it if you can give us an insight into what some of those things are. 
Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, I guess the analyst role is to be an extension of the coaching arm. And obviously, normally what will happen on a match day is we'll be sat up somewhere nice and high in the stadium um, and we'll be taking in like a wide angle shot of the game, obviously, which allows us to see all the players at all time, which is obviously massively important when you're trying to analyse what a team's trying to do, where the spaces are and, and all that type of thing. So I guess there's almost a bit of a checklist that I would normally go through in terms of the type of things we're looking for. The first thing is always to find out is the opposition formation what we thought it was going to be um, and just to kind of get that one checked off in the first couple of minutes. Obviously, if it is, that's fine. If it isn't, we need to get that down to the bench straight away just to confirm, look, guys, it's not what we thought it was going to be. And then that might allow us to make our first change tactically. Then as the first half goes on, um, it's basically the way that I've always worked and the way that I've been asked to work at the moment is to could kind of cross-check are we executing our game plan both in positive and negative ways and then obviously ev evidence in that information ready to show the management and players at half time um, a bit of an extension of that is so are there any areas where we're really excelling you know are we able to get at their right back for example quite a lot or is there a lot of space in midfield and then obviously on the contrary is there any areas that we're struggling with you know are we not really controlling their transition very well all those type of specific bits of information that basically, you know, we can use to, to hopefully improve our performance for the second half. Um, and I guess the last little bit on it is that you've, you've got to keep it really specific and brief. You know, you think about half time, it's 15 minutes, but actually in that window of 15 minutes, you've probably got three or four at the very max to have your, your time with the management, if you like. So, yeah, I think key details are always looking where the space is. Are we executing our game plan? And, you know, what basically can I do to help the team improve their performance for the second half? Richard, can I ask a couple of really probably stupid follow-up questions? Um, no, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> you'll, you'll get used to these. Um, <laughs> when you say you get, you, the first one is when you say you get the information to the, the bench. I'm, I'm really interested how you do that. And then secondly, you, I, I, I obviously get you, you're preparing information for halftime. Do you? Does that stop in the second half or is there still information from you guys to the, the bench in the second half? Oh, look, it's Richard Frozen. Oh. Yeah, so I've kind of worked in a few different ways depending on the clubs I've been at. So um, I think when I was at Reading, it was just a case of using radios and we were hooked up to, I think it was the goalkeeping coach at the time and we would just feed information through him to then be passed to the bench. Um, as we progressed into Man City and Anderlecht now, um, we had like a, um, a setup that allowed you to have an iPad or a, a Mac on the bench and we could basically send down live images to the bench as well that the, the coaching staff would be looking at. Um, so, yeah, it, I think obviously depending on what infrastructure you've got, you know, you can either just send verbal messages or if you're able to send video, then obviously even better because it's, it's clearer and those guys can, you know, take in the information that they see from the video as well. Um, and yeah, second half, no, it does, it does continue. Um, and obviously it becomes probably more about, you know, are the opposition changing shape as they're making subs? Um, sometimes as well, it can be little things on, you know, like defending set pieces and things like that. Are, the, are we still doing all our roles? You know, sometimes a sub comes on and he might not completely understand what he should be doing. So just all those little bits and pieces like that, anywhere where we, we can gain half a percent, you know, 0.1%, it's all hopefully there to help us win that game ultimately that's brilliant thank you for that Richard appreciate that um, look, everybody that's just joined um, a, little, a little bit lately remember if you hear anything and you want to want to know more and I don't ask the right follow up question please please answer it in, uh, ask it in the in the chat um, Andy so there, there's a good example of sort of um, analysis having an immediate impact I suppose your question is a little bit more around some of the long term impact so um, if possible could you explain the process of how analysis can influence and impact on the coaching programme yeah, um, first off with, with that question, I mean, it's a really good question and I'm, I'm really glad that you've used the word impact and influence there. So I'm, I'm, I'm a really big believer that as analysts, we're, we're here to impact the practice and not replace it. And, and what I mean by that in, in really simple terms is that in most cases, ultimately, we can't make a player better at kicking a football by sitting in front of a screen, watching himself or or reading him a load of stats. So most of the time he needs to be out there on the grass with the ball at his feet. So if we go back to those sort of important words, the influence and the impact it is absolutely about that. And I think probably 
the best way I can answer that is is giving you a quick overview of, of sort of my process and then what happens off the back of that. So <clears throat> similar to probably Richard, every game we'll do a live and team individual code. So what that's doing is just breaking down everything that happens in the game. And we'll then do a more in-depth individual coding afterwards to, to break down absolutely every action that a player does himself. And we'll break that down into a successful and unsuccessful. So if you imagine you have a screen in front of you that has, say, passing, crossing, tackling, heading, successful and unsuccessful with a, with a number underneath it. Um, it's, it's probably really important to note there as well that we have to define exactly what we mean by successful. So a successful cross is a lot more difficult to define than a successful pass. So as long as you have your definitions there, then, <clears throat> then you'll be okay. What I try to do is try and be as objective as I can um, in this stage of, of the process. So after we've done that, we've then got that complete breakdown of, of each action during the game in the form of numbers, like I said. So these numbers themselves, they don't really mean anything though. So all you're seeing is just lots of numbers on a spreadsheet, which could lead you to a conclusion just looking at the numbers alone. Um, <clears throat> so we need to contextualize those numbers. So rather than looking at, um, let's choose passing and see 20 successful passes and 10 unsuccessful passes, we're not jumping straight to the conclusion, you're poor at keeping the ball, you're not very good at passing. We're trying to look at them as questions rather than numbers. So you imagine instead of the number, it's just a question mark. So we're saying, why were you successful 33% of the time? Or what did you do well 66% of the time? <clears throat> and the other way we try and contextualize it is, is obviously the position you play is, uh, can play a part in this. If you're playing in midfield, um, you're probably going to be keeping the ball better than a number nine. Um, the opposition you're playing against, the state of the game, the time of the game, were they under pressure? Were they not under pressure? Was it a forward pass to, to thread in a striker to shoot? example so already we're trying to contextualize what that data actually means rather than what the numbers are saying um <clears throat> and it's, it's probably important to say that we're dealing with um learning and development with the players that we are so although the stats are great for giving you a readout of absolute facts which you might use at a more senior level um at, at the level we're working at we we really want to be asking questions so that we can learn and, and develop as much as possible um, so what we're then able to do through uh, sports code, which is the sort of the industry standard, which I'm, I'm guessing everyone's using, um, is we're able to view those, those actions in isolation. So I can click on those 10 passes that the player's given away. I can watch every single one, one after the other, and look for a trend in it. So rather than it being, you're not very good at passing, it could be, well, you've not scanned, so you've not seen the opportunity over the other side of the pitch and you're forcing it back the way it's came from. <clears throat> so it's really important that we can look at them in isolation to, to try and find those trends. So, so within that process where we've got the, the data in front of us, we've raised the question about performance. So why are you giving the ball away 10 times there? <clears throat> we've then assessed the evidence. So we've looked at um, every single one in isolation and seeing a trend and we're now able to form an opinion or an answer to that question. So we've raised the question, looked at the evidence and now hopefully we're able to answer the question. And then that answer or, or opinion is, is fed back to coaches, <clears throat> which is almost the, the penultimate stage of that process. And that word opinion is probably one of the most important things in that because although many of the answers that, that we try and provide to our coaches are completely objective, so you didn't scan there, it was a poor pass. Sometimes that is completely objective. And that's what we strive for in every case. A lot of the time, <clears throat> what we come up with is actually just an opinion, especially within the, the development and the, the learning environment that we're in. So whether based on fact or not, the whole game is, is built on opinions as well, which is probably important to, to understand. And that's probably one of the things that makes the game and, and sport so, so special. So from from that opinion or that answer we're then able to produce actions or interventions going forward through conversations with coaches so that might be a review with the individual to talk him through what we've seen or what we found or it could be that that answer raised um raised the point that we need to do an extra blocking training on a specific phase of play <clears throat> so it's probably the long way of answering it in short my answer would probably be 
um, we impact and influence the coaching program by raising and answering questions about performance and then providing feedback that leads to informed decision making, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. Yeah, I really like that, Andy. And uh, it's the first time anyone said I've asked a good question. So thank you for that <laughs> as well. Um, just to follow up on that, it's clear that you work in uh, collaboration with the coaches. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it was really interesting, your role at the beginning, you, you know, you've got to, if it's, if it's two camps, you've got a foot in both camps. Um, but in terms of those definitions, um, who comes up with them? Or is that another example of important to work in collaboration? Yeah, that the relationships you build with coach, and I've been really, really lucky. The, the coaches that I've worked with have, have always been really, really open and, and at least act like they value my opinion so it's quite easy to to work in collaboration with them so as soon as you come up with those definitions it just means you're all on the same page when you're having conversations they're much more efficient and effective so if I'm talking about an unsuccessful craft what I mean by that is we didn't get first contact on it so those conversations go a lot quicker and nobody's nothing's falling between the gaps everybody understands and is on the same page yeah thank you Steve, um, a bit more of a, a seemingly a straightforward question in terms of understanding, but I get there's going to be a lot of detail behind this, I know. But uh, <laughs> Steve, what, what do you look for when analysing opponents? So my role is to provide Richard with the information uh, for the first team management um, by scouting games. Um, there's a difference between scouting and analysing. Um, analysings were usually training ground based they get all the information in um, from people like myself and then they put this, put stuff together for the first team management and staff <clears throat> my role is to to build a framework of information for him so my information will probably be based around objective and factual based events during the game which will include goalkeeper restarts um, second phase secure possession, how do teams play, do they play over, through or around. Um, the defending shape, is it a mid block, high press, triggers for that, a low block, counter attacks, a game plan, both attacking and defending, set plays and personnel and, and players. So my process is probably formation, shape, pattern, personnel. So when I go and watch a game, I have a process of how I'm thinking. So my first thing, I've watched the team we're playing. So, so my role is to go and watch the last game. So I've already watched the previous two games on Sports Code and Huddle, clipped the bits I need to clip. So I've got a good understanding of, of how, how they're going to play, what their DNA is, who the manager is, who the personnel is, what shapes have been playing. And then for me to go there with a process and say, right, I identify that shape. So, so let's say, keep it nice and easy, 4-4-2. Um, what personnel are playing in that 4-4-2? Are they playing with two wingers? Or are they playing with one winger and one centre mid in a wide area? Are the fullbacks fullbacks? Are centre-offs centre-offs? How do they play out from the back? What four ways are they using? Because when you, when, you when you play the game, you, you can really only play out four ways center half, center mids, full back, center forwards. So are they direct on the center forward? That's first phase. And then what happens in the second phase? If they play out from the back through the center halves, what's their decisions? Do they overplay? How do they play through the thirds? So there's, there's a whole lot of processes going on in your mind to identify what their game plan is. And then my role is to then to feed all that information back to Richard, who will then look for those instances during the game and then he will put together a 9 10 12 minute video of how they play and then he talks about his process after the whistle starts so our process is to build it to the whistle and then Richard takes over from after the whistle to provide the information as an interactive analyst it's really interesting and and again probably an obvious question but you say you do the like the three games before what's what's the reason behind three games is it is it purely resources or is it that uh, the stuff that's happened earlier, the football changes so much maybe that it, it becomes irrelevant or? 
Now, I just think it is a process. We, I, I go back further, but I just usually just look at shapes. You know, teams might change, might have gone to a five, and I want to know why, but that was maybe six games ago. But then over the last three games, there's been a trend of maybe playing 4 2 3 1. So if they've been over the last two or three games and played that shape, there's a good chance they're going to turn up and play 4 2 3 1 against us. So I just, just to get the idea of getting those teams in my mind and why I do it. But I've, I've been in this league now for five years. I sort of I understand the shape, I understand the teams, the DNA of the club, the DNA of the managers and the owners of what they're trying to achieve. Um, so, and just a case of me then getting that information down so it's readable and spongible for people like Richard and first team staff to say the information quickly, to, to turn around deadlines, et cetera, et cetera, to work on onto the next game. And then once that game's finished, it's like today I'm working on for next Saturday, but this afternoon I'll be working on Tuesday and the Saturday after. So I'm always two games in front of myself. But, but I've seen these teams, you know, I, I think I read it down the other day, I've seen Q, like Queen's Park Rangers. I've seen them 14 times in 14 months, you know, and I've only ever done two match reports on them or three match reports on them, but I've still seen QPR 14 times because they've played other teams. So you sort of get an idea of what formations, but I think for me, it's about just understanding shape, game plan, and what they're trying to do. You must be the uh, the most annoyed person when a game gets cancelled, Steve. Uh, having done all that work, it has been used. <laughs> it's not the best. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Steve. Look, thank you guys. That's a really uh, really good start and a really fascinating insight into. Into, into you know your jobs and your world at um at first team at, at, at academy level so thank you very much look the next question is the same for all three of you and um don't worry if your answer is the same as um the, the, the person that's gone before you um but there, there is obviously you know a group of coaches um on this call who will be coaching different contexts different teams etc and I, I'm sure there'll be some people who, who, who maybe an answer to that, that, that your first question is like, oh, well, you're so lucky to have all that uh, uh, technology, resources, but we haven't got that. So I, I want you to kind of uh, answer that really and, and give advice to, I put grassroots coach really, but uh, advice to any coach um, who, who has got limited resources and limited experience and perhaps give some advice on how they can still use analysis or principles of analysis to still support their own team players and themselves. So, uh, Richard, I don't know if you've got any any advice for me and others. Yeah, so, well, I mean, I, I think it's such a good question because actually I only, I didn't even know that analysis existed until my second year of university. So, you know, in terms of that, I mean, I'm not ancient by any means, but, you know, I was talking, what, about nine years ago? I didn't even know it existed. So, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not that long period of time to go from kind of, to absolutely nothing to you know to thankfully the journey that I've been on and the places I've been able to work and and the other thing I would say as well is I think first of all you just got to be open to try things and the fact that you know everybody who's on this webinar now and people who are trying to do self-improvement and all that type of stuff is the right mindset to have in terms of just getting stuck in you know like oh uh, maybe you can you've got your friend who's got a, a camera oh can you bring that along and we can have a go at trying to film our game or we can try and film one of our training sessions you know just just have a go with it and I think that's first of all you've just got to be open to try things and you know you'll try something and it and it won't work and you'll try something and, you're, and you'll really like it but I think first part of protocol for me is just having an open mind to to try something different because it will probably be something that you might not have even considered before or something you've never tried so I think that's the first point of call um but obviously even if that's you know that's not a possibility look you haven't got anybody to film where you can't you just haven't got that that facility um i know a lot of teams and obviously you know as i say there's a hell of a lot of students out there now who want applied experience again if you can attach yourself to some college to some university to some school the beauty of it is that a lot of these places have all of the equipment or at least some of it um and you know you can almost bring somebody in let you know you're you're basically giving someone an, an, an internship which is massively important in this industry now because a lot of people can't even get internships at clubs without having experience so you have to kind of tick that pre-box before you even get to the you know the the internship box um and then there's a couple of like really simple ways that you can you can do things so I'll, I'll kind of give an example from an individual development point of view and then from a team point of view as well 
So I don't know, let's just say you're working with your winger and you want to improve his crossing, for example. Now you might do a couple of sessions with him on crossing and you might just manually note down. And obviously really important what Andy said earlier as well is you need to uh, be in agreement with that player. What What's your expectation? As long as a player understands what your expectation is, then we can really work on, you know, hopefully improving their game. So you might do a couple of sessions with them. And then when it comes to the game, uh, if you're the manager of the team, for example, and obviously you've got plenty going on, you might be able to get one of your coaches to just go, right, today, I just want you to count the right wingers crosses, how many were successful, how many were unsuccessful. And once you start to plot that over a period of time, you can see whether, you know, he is able to develop. And then if he's not, well, what are the reasons for that? Is he getting the ball enough? You know, have we got enough players in the box? Whatever it can be, you know. So that's one example in terms of really basic notational analysis, just purely scoring off numbers, how many are successful, how many aren't. And then I guess from a team point of view, we'll use the wingers again, just because I'll stick with that example. So, and, and as I say, it probably lends itself to that individual example. So if we're a team that wants to get our wingers 1v1, well, how many times is that actually happening in the game? First of all, you can do it over a few games and see, okay, well, if we're only getting our wingers, I don't know, two times in a game, 1v1, there's obviously something not right. So then maybe that's the point when if you're able to, you might be able to film a game or something and you can see, well, why isn't that happening? And then you can start to make corrections based off the information that you've gathered. So obviously in an ideal world, yes, you can film all your games and you can have all the technology and everything nice and fancy to, to do everything. But there's still lots that can be done just by notational analysis, you know, counting numbers and all that type of stuff to give you the evidence to then hopefully make you make corrections and improve player and team performance thanks Richard and I think probably one of the points there is being really clear about what's the important data you want to collect I suppose yeah definitely you know just I think just setting that expectation so that like um, Andy said earlier that everybody understands what it is you're trying to achieve so so if I'm saying what a winger 1v1 is that I need to make sure as my player that you're going to understand that and that as a coaching staff we all agree on that because then it's a common goal and it's it's achievable for everybody then Thank you, Richard. Andy, any 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 extra advice? Um, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it'd be quite similar. I think just don't overcomplicate it. One of the best coaches that, that I've ever worked with, he's, at, he's actually on this call, so you probably won't like me saying this, but that's Frank O'Brien. And he's got this saying um, that he won't claim to be his, but that simplicity is genius a lot of the time. So the fact that you might have limited reef resources it can also be your gift rather than a curse so you can devote a hell of a lot more focus and time into one or two things during a game rather than having the ability to look at thousands of different actions that are happening within a game so really focusing on those one or two things and doing them well rather than lots of things things poorly so <clears throat> i think my advice would be just start with a question in your mind that you that you want to answer and again, like Richard is saying there, define exactly what information you need to be able to answer that. So, for example, say you're looking at, um, you're going into a Saturday game thinking about why my centre midfield player is only making sideways, pass sideways passes or why he seems to only be doing that. Straight away off the top of my head, <clears throat> I know that I need to know how many forward passes, backward passes, sideways passes he's making. So you could maybe ask one of the subs, if you've got subs, just to note down, just notational analysis, like Richard is saying, the number of forward passes, number of sideways passes, number of backward passes, that then frees you up to actually really focus on what's happening during the game. So, and look for the rest of the information you need, like, is he scanning? Is he on the half turn? Is he receiving back foot? Does he have good enough technique to actually be able to play forward and break lines? Um, and I guarantee with that amount of focus, you'll be able to see exactly where it's breaking down. So when you then go back to the play, the, the player, you've got the, the factual objective evidence in the numbers that you're, you're only passing forward three times in this game. So, but you've also got your opinion on how you can fix him through the focus that you've played and the attention you've paid to it. So you've only done it three times. There's your fact, but it's all right on how to fix it. Just get on the half turn a little bit more, receive on that back foot and you'll be able to see your options to play forward. So, <clears throat> so yeah, my advice would be just nothing is too simple. Um, and if you can't absolutely analyze, 
if you can't analyze absolutely everything, just analyze a couple of things and, and do it really, really well. Yeah, I guess an added bonus there is I guess there's some benefits for that sub who's doing it as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe even use the, use a sub that plays in the same position, little things like that. So you're getting an added benefit with the players actually doing the analysis as well. Uh, Steve, I'm not sure if there's any advice left, but if there is, please please share it with us. Well, from, from my from my point of view, from my role, I think if you're going, you know, I'm an A licensed coach. I transferred into into scouting, so the best way I found to do that was to watch games. So currently, I watch nine games a week. I watch six on video and three live, uh, and I do that week on week. Uh, throughout the whole season so I think it's really key if you're falling into the, the, the scouting opposition role then you watch as many games because that will give you the information that you're going to need of process uh, formations patterns etc uh, etc et from that and I think you've got to really find a way to take that information from your eye into your mind and then for your mind to actually write it down um, in a way that is simple enough for coaches and players to absorb quickly. So whether or not that's a bullet pointed or whether or not that's a paragraph, that will depend on how the analyst wants to take in the information, how the manager wants to take in the information. So I think it's key that, that you watch games, find a way that you write how you see things, be objective have no bias, team A versus team B. Um, I think that's really key when you're watching games. Knowledge how that shape and formation works and what their game plan and what they're trying to achieve. Um, and then probably like have a clear understanding of, of what that opposition are, are trying to do. And I think once you get those elements all together, then you can start to, to write and, be, and do that presentation and then fine, but end users or managers or, or analysts will take in information differently. So you have to be adaptable, as I'm finding out right now. But obviously, what's happened at Cardiff, you know, and now, and now we've got a new manager. So I'm, I'm learning to adapt to the way that, that we want to work. Do we change our process? It's working at the moment, um, but that could change over a period of time. So it's just being adaptable, but nothing really changes. The game will always be the game. So it's just how you see it and how you write about it and how you report back to it. So the more games you watch, the better you will be at it. And it's the same as that 10,000 hour rule. It's the same as coaching, it's the same as any role. To be an expert, you have to do 10,000 hours, they say. So the more you put into it, the more you will get back out of out of the situation that you're in. I, I like the point that you're obviously, you're obviously writing for someone else, but I like the fact that, you know, the point of grassroots coaches, they're probably writing for themselves. And it's probably just as valuable to, to record those those thoughts and those, those not just thoughts, but they, the objective data as well as the, the subjective thoughts and feelings. Yeah, it's good. Thank you, Steve. Look, guys, take a, a little rest at the moment because um, I'm going to ask Drew to uh, give us a. <laughs> it says in my notes here, Drew, a quick summary, but that's that's unfair. Uh, you can give us a summary as long as you like, mate, because I know you've probably got uh, already gone through a pad of paper. Yeah, um, I have three days of my diary gone already, so that's good work. I'll be thrilled. But um, what I'm going to try and do is not go over it all. I'm going to try and analyse and synthesise here. I've gone for three main points, Gareth. I'm trying something new. Here we go. So <clears throat> the first one is that the analysis is the uh, extension of the coaching arm. Um, so the impact and influence not to replace. Um, but importantly, to do that, you need to know what's going to be defined as success within that model. And then... Obviously, it also goes across that point of what what phase people are working in and the context. So it's going to be different in youth to to um, senior and probably um, therefore links back to what's been worked on in that week. I would say just from a coaching piece back on there that it's that it might be more around how you're going to develop or how you're going to win. Um, the second one is that idea of um, formation, shape, pattern, personnel, and that listening to the guys is probably similar whether you're working on your own team or um, on an opposition 
and then the the big one for me is the that idea of not over, over complicating things so um that simplicity is genius bit good line by the way but um you know i i think that probably also links a lot to to what i see in coach education when delivering it here and um, whenever we do analysis it tends to be a, a a huge piece of work because when we all watch the game you can see a million things and that sometimes seems like the more more people get down um the more it seems like you know what you're talking about but it's probably around understanding a what's actually useful and particularly when it comes to that game day stuff just how much a coach or a player can actually take in um that's going to be um pretty minimal um that you might have a couple of minutes or if it's a play you might be able to tell them one meaningful thing so overloading them with um it might actually um, be more harmful than good and then i think the other thing that was really good out of that and probably links a lot to, to what we talk about sometimes guys that idea of just um, engaging all that especially in the youth space engage all the players that are that are on your bench is a you know i think a, a fantastic way to actually have people doing it and i know i know in our space we get them to do some of that analysis and then actually feed it back to their peers and it, it goes into some of the things we've talked about on this um this before right about you're not just developing players that are technically and tactically there but that's like social bit of well can you actually tell a player what they're doing good bad or indifferent and help them with an answer whether it's right or wrong um then it, that might give you a coaching point that you can then work with those with those players as well very good work mate three points like it uh, we'll, 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 that, that's now the feature uh thanks drew uh sean um, any good questions in the chat that you're either going to ask on people's behalf or you're going to let them come off screen and, and ask? Yeah, so we've got one, if uh, a really good question. Well, I've got a couple of good questions, but one from uh, Brian, so if he could just uh, come out. I just asked him there if you could come on screen and ask that about objectivity and opinions, which is a really good one. So do you want to come off there, Brian? You might have to step in, Sean. All right, yeah, no problem. Like, so what, what he was asking was like, the, how do you find that balance between you need an objective measure of what you're an, an, analyzing <clears throat> and also about including your opinion? So uh, I think he particularly asked it when you were talking, Andy. So it would be good if you answered that one. Yeah, that's it's a really, really good question. That so uh, there's probably two answers to it. So everything that we do within youth football or academy football is about preparing players for ultimately going on to have a career in the professional game, whatever level we can get them to. So <clears throat> what they're then exposed to when they get into the senior game, if anyone's watched Sky Sports, uh, BT Sport, I'm not sure what you guys have in Australia, but everything is stats, 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 stats. So educating players on how to read and understand those stats and understanding that those numbers there don't mean that I'm a bad player. Those numbers there don't mean that I'm a good player trying to understand and interpret that data. So <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why we try and be as objective as we can. The other reason is <clears throat> we want to, and it's important to, to go back to that point about defining exactly what we mean by the success and, and unsuccessful. We don't use that as a way of grading players. And again, like I just said before, we don't use it to say you're a good player or a bad player. We use those stats and those numbers to draw questions or raise questions about the performance. So if I try and describe the screen I have after a game, I've got every single player with his breakdown on my screen in front of me. Now, I know that a centre-back, if he's given the ball away more than 15% of the time, that there's a question there. Why are you giving the ball away that much? If there's a number nine who's had eight shots and eight shots on target, that's pretty standout as well. So those numbers and being objective there is just so that I can raise questions afterwards. So when I'm looking at my dashboard and I'm seeing there's a question up here about your passing, there's a question here about your shooting. That's the only reason that I want to be really, really objective so that I can then look at all of those instances in, in isolation and find out why that number is that number. So hopefully that, and then form that opinion. Like I said, it could be that, I think he's good at shooting because he's getting his plant foot right next to the ball. He's striking with his laces and he's got really good technique. It could be that the guy next to me is watching it and he's thinking, no, it's just because he's making the right decision at the right time to shoot. So that opinion, you're not necessarily wrong. Nobody's necessarily right. It's just that everybody will look at the same thing 
And out of 10 people, you'll probably have four different points of view, five different points of view. So that's what I mean there about the opinion. Thank you, Andy. Would you suggest there that like a, an, analysis, uh, an analyst needs to have either a good relationship with the head coach or a back, what would you say is the most important, the good relationship or a background in football coaching themselves? I think your relationship, your relationship and, and being on the same page, I think is a, is a massive thing. And that trust you have between coach analysts. So I'm, I'm very lucky that I come from a, from a coaching background. So I get that buy-in, hopefully, a little bit with the coaches that I work with. Um, but I could probably phrase that word opinion completely differently and say football knowledge. So rather than expressing your opinion on something, you're expressing your football knowledge upon it instead. All right. yeah, no. Sean, is there another question? Yeah, there's one more question there as well, and it might be to Andy again, so you seem to be getting a little bit of a hammer in here, mate. Oh, I think that <laughs> maybe Richard or Steve can jump in on his behalf. Uh, it's like, how does the uh, provision of analysis change across the uh, different age groups at academy level or youth level? How, how, does, the, uh, how does the impact of analysis change? Do you want me to dive in, Andy, and oh. I'll, uh, I'll save you on this one. I'll give you a breather. <laughs> yeah, so I get, and I think it's been touched on earlier anyway, but basically as you're working through those, I kind of, the way that I've always, the clubs that I've worked at, I've, I've kind of split it into almost three parts. So you've got like the the very initial, I can't remember what exactly age it goes up to, but you get that very like fundamental stage where it's basically about working on, you know, technique of turning with the ball, passing the very, very early parts. And then as you go through to the development part of the game, it's, you know, it's basically about, like Andy's mentioned, improving players. Um, obviously, then as you're moving up into 11 v 11, it started to get those principles for that team, you know, into, into their players and how they want to play. Obviously, in an ideal world, then it's about preparing players for first team football for that team you're working for. But obviously, that's especially if you're working at the very top level, that's a very small few players that are able to make that jump. So then it's about preparing players for first team football. Um, and obviously that, you know, there's a lot of teams, obviously Chelsea's a, a, a great example of that, where, you know, if they're not able to get players into the first team, they're able to sell them into first team football, you know, at various different levels. And it's a big part of teams' business models now, you know, um, if you can sell a player for, for five, six million, even less than that, if you're selling 10 players for two million, all of a sudden you're making the club a, a hell of a lot of money from your academy, even though you're not able to, you know, get them into your own first team. You're getting these guys into careers, you know, at, at varying different levels. Can I ask maybe a follow-up question to that? I don't mind who answers it, but is there a, is there an argument to delay any sort of analysis at the younger age groups? I know, I know this is your profession, so it's, it's going to say no, Gareth. But uh, and I know it's a bit of a loaded question, Andy. You've come off mute, so uh, um, what do you think? I think yes is the answer. We, we have a very, like Richard was saying, a very step leathered approach. So our under nines and tens, <clears throat> they'll follow a very, very limited program of analysis. A lot of the time, once they sign under nine, um, it'll only just be highlights, just getting used to watching yourself. So there's not really any analysis that happens. You're just getting used to watching your own performance back. And then as you get up, then, then we're starting to tailor it more to the individual and the level that you're playing and, and so on. Does that sort of answer that? Yeah, yeah, it does. I suppose my loaded part of this question is, you know, it's, it's obviously a key part of the elite game. And I wonder whether, you know, we want to keep it being a sort of almost a, a learning or a chore or homework type thing. So I wondered you have to be quite creative of how you, you do it. And obviously watching highlights, kids are going to love watching highlights of themselves. So yeah, no, that, that does yeah. answer that. I think on that as well, Gareth, obviously it's so, um, it's basically everywhere we look at the minute you turn the television on, there's somebody who's got one of those interactive screens analysing somebody's performance, it's everywhere. So actually, like you're saying, for these for these young kids, you know, I'm jealous that when I was young that we it, it wasn't about. Uh, that you, you love nothing more as a young footballer to see yourself playing and watching your own performance. And that's a really good kind of base, if you like, foundation for what's to come in future years. Because I think that's the beauty of it now is that all of these current footballers are growing up with analysis as a part of their journey. It's ingrained into them now. So when they get to, you know, that bit bit later on in their journey, maybe around first team, they are much more receptive and, and used to the benefits that it can give. 
Yeah, thank you. I suppose it was a uh, it was looking at as it obviously part of learning and also part of motivation rather than a monitoring role. I suppose is where I was I was trying to get to. So yeah, thank you guys. Um, well, Richard, while you're on, I'm, I'll ask you uh, um, another question. Thanks for that, Sean. And, and by the way, coaches out there, there's another opportunity to there'll be more opportunities to um, ask some of your questions. So please keep keep Sean busy in that that chat room, please. Um, so, Richard, how does analysis play a part in talent identification and or scouting? Now, I know I realise in my question I had those sort of together, but they're different things, really. So I wonder how analysis plays a role in either one of those or, or both of those. Yeah, so I, I, again, obviously, it probably completely depends on in terms of what level you're working at and, and how many people you've got working for your club. Um, I, I think a lot of the time, um, analysts, it's kind of a natural progression is to go and work into scouting afterwards. That's kind of a, a very well-trodden path in terms of, of, of what analysts may be going to do afterwards. Um, so I'm looking up at the moment um, that I've been able to work close with, with scouting in, in the role that I'm, I'm currently in. Um, and I think it's it's um, it's natural at the moment because obviously you know with every travel restrictions everywhere and basically people are having to take in games um, through video more, which obviously you know I'll be completely with Steve in terms of ideally for me if you can go out and watch a game live then that's always going to be better than the video. Um, but what it does do, and especially for teams you know working with smaller budgets, it allows you to do a lot of surveillance before you're then going to go and spend money on flights, you know, going to, if it's a player playing abroad, for example, or travel to a game, it allows you to do that initial kind of search uh, a lot broader before you want to start really honing in on who your targets are. And then maybe it might be a case of, you know, somebody more senior in the club is going to go and have a, have a look at these players. Um, and I think as well, there's a, there's a lot of clubs now that are using um, data quite heavily to kind of for that initial search. So, you know, you can literally, I know, um, especially at City, they had um, sort of algorithms set up where they could basically be cons analysing any player who was playing in the world. And they would just be literally running in the background in terms of, you know, if they were hitting certain performance indicators, right, that player would get flagged up. And then maybe that would take you to then go right okay the data's flagged up this player let's have a look at him on the video and then obviously from that point the video might be oh, okay no it's not actually what we're looking for or it might be okay if this player looks interesting maybe we can go and watch him in further detail so i think <clears throat> the power of technology and all the information we've got available to us now it probably just allows you to be rather than having to maybe have a bit of a stab in the dark sometimes or kind of work in you know, it, it just basically allows you to 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 get to the, the point quicker than what you would otherwise, um, just by just by using, you know, having things like data to support the process and um yeah, just gets you to the end point quicker, hopefully, and a bit more refined. So Richard, when the data um reveals a player and then you get to the, the, the video phase, you, you sort of mentioned some performance indicators. Um I don't think I'm sure they're um, 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 different for each club. So I don't expect you to reveal them all, but are there sort of some that you might be able to say that might be position specific or something? So it does it purely, but I suppose, does it purely become a subjective thing at that stage and someone just looks and go, yeah, I like the look of that player or is there still performance indicators that, that might be position specific? Well, again, so, it, and I think this is becoming a bit of a, a theme of this chat. It just basically comes down to what your, what do you want from that manager, from that club? What is your, you know, what is your philosophy? What is your blueprint that you're working towards? So I don't know if I'm going to be, <clears throat> if I'm a manager who likes to play um, long balls to a big number nine, then obviously, and we're looking for a number nine, then that's obviously going to be a massive indicator for us as well. You know, how good is he on aerial duels? How good is he at holding up the ball? How good is he at link and play? So there's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's literally, however, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever your philosophy is, however you want to play, you just need to fit what you're looking for to that. And, and that's, and that's, and that's it. So it's as simple as that. It's, it's nice that the, the uh, indicators <clears throat> result from, um, you know, like you say, your playing philosophy. And your, your yeah. Thank you. Um, Andy, I love this question that's coming up to you and you've got Drew to thank you for it. And I'm also really keen that if Steve and Richard would have answered it differently, that they jump in and have a little argument with you as well. Uh, so the question is, Andy, 
if you could only analyse one thing, would it be your team, your players or the opponent? Yeah, I think we're probably all going to disagree. Yeah. I, hope um, so. <laughs> I think in, in my environment and, and probably my preference, probably because of the environment I'm in, would be my players. Um, they're the most important people as far as we're concerned, like, again, especially in our environment. So in complete honesty, I can't control the opposition and what they do um, in academy football. We don't do a lot of opposition analysis. Even if we did, we don't know what players are going to play. We don't know what system they're going to play. <clears throat> it's very difficult, very difficult to tell. So ultimately, we're not sure what the opposition are going to do. We, we can't do anything there. The, the team, we can do a little bit, um, but again, what we're after is trying to prepare individuals to go on to be successful. Yes, we always want our teams to win. We always want to do well in, in every game or every competition that we, that we enter. But again, the, the main goal for us is for our individuals to do well and to go on to, to have a, a good career at whatever level. So <clears throat> all I can really hope for is to, to try and impact the players that I work with and help them improve as much as, as I can or learn in any way as I can. So, Again, hopefully by taking care of our own individual performances and understanding their roles and, and requirements that they have in order to be successful within that team, um, you'd hope that, that everything else should take care of itself in, in our environment. Again, I probably used that word environment too many times there, haven't I? <laughs> Good, Andy. And I'll tell you, before I'm, I'm going to see if Richard and Steve are going to have an argument with you, I'm going to ask you another question, which is, okay, and I know these hypothetical questions are horrible, aren't they? But if you could only analyse one thing of your players, what would that one thing be? Success. Success. Always try and focus on success if you can and reinforce that. I think the, and probably when I started as well, you always want to look for what, what's gone wrong. How do we improve? Um, or how do we make the things that we're not good at better? But one of the things that I've really, really learned is especially with the, the incredibly gifted kids that you get, really focus on what makes them special and what the, makes them so successful. If you can just get them to focus on that and make that even better and even better and even better, the rest of it will, will come there. I think so, yes, yeah, success, that's what I'd, I'd focus on. As you were answering that, Andy, on my screen, a, a question from Daryl Harris of uh, Plymouth Argyle came up about you know, how much do you analyse players' super strengths? So it was perfect timing. Um, so I hope that answers it for you, Daryl. Uh, Richard, Steve, do you want to have an argument with Andy about uh, about that? They both come <laughs> off mute straight away. <laughs> Go on, Steve. I'll let you have the floor first. Go on, mate. <laughs> no, you know, obviously, Andy works in a completely, go back to that word again, environment. You know, so, you know, my environment is about three points on a Saturday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. So my focus is always going to be on the opponent and, their strengths and weaknesses and how can we um, input our our shape and our strengths and weaknesses onto their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so, for, so, mate, so it all comes down to environment. We all work in, in different environments and I have to work closely with Rich. So because we've got three points at, at stake uh, and then it, it moves on where Andy works in that environment where, where he's producing, we're at the other end where it's already been produced and now we have to, we have to, get those three points and we have we are a percentage of the whole of a hundred percent so whether or not i put in 15 percent of it and uh, richard puts in 15 percent that's 30 percent the coaches put in another percentage etc and, and the whole match day experience is all regards comes down to the opponent and three points on a saturday or wednesday whenever we're playing so i, I get it where andy's coming from because i've been in that position as a center defense manager where it's a development development you know success pathways but but now i'm on the other side of that fence for the last 15 years I, I get it that that players can take you so far but then we have to put in the the groundwork on the other side for players to be successful at the top end richard would you agree with that yeah well i was just going to say uh, you've both given the the two of the three answers so i'll go for the third one because that was actually my answer anyway is, uh, is, is that yeah well i know yeah god Oh, that, that 15 minutes we had before was great, guys. Well done. Uh, <laughs> and no, so, um, yeah, I mean, I would always, um, I would go for for your own team um, and just based on the fact that 
I think obviously from a club's point of view, they bring basically when a club hires a manager, they're buying into that that person, his his philosophy, his DNA, whatever you want to call it. Then the club is investing in that. So I I'm of the opinion that if that manager is able to get his um, information and his style across to the team to the best of his ability, then in theory that should be successful. Now, obviously, I know it doesn't always work that way. There's lots of other variables and things that happen, but um, you know, as much as um, I think one of the guys said it before, as much as it's great to have all the information on the opposition and things like that, um, I've always been brought up with the opinion that, that if we're able to execute our own game plan as well as we can, then that should be enough to get us past an opponent. Now, obviously, we're going to be flexible in that game plan and things will change based on the information that we find on the opposition, but they're very subtle changes. And we also have to have the ability to be able to, you know, execute those changes. So, you know, you see it a lot now where uh, managers are changing formations in games and then obviously your team has to react to that. And it's only teams that have worked on it. And, you know, that basically the players need to know, look, if X happens, we do this. If Y happens, we do this. And that can only happen if they understand the manager's philosophy and that the manager's you know, managed to get that information into his players. So I'll give you the third answer. I couldn't and have asked that. I, couldn't have, I, couldn't have, <laughs> I did I did grill Andy a little bit more, so I'm gonna come back to you, Andy, again. Uh, Richard, you if you if you can only analyze one thing with your team, what would be the one thing? And I forgot to ask Steve this. I might go back to Steve on this as well in a minute. So you only had a, a, uh, able to analyze one thing for your <clears> team. Oh, I'm, it's so so difficult. I mean, ba- just based on the fact that I obviously worked at Manchester City for six years and obviously working at Anderlecht now, we're teams that are based on possession. We want to have the ball and we want to keep the ball. So I would focus on uh, attacking phases, but I'm saying that through massive gritted teeth because you need to be able to control the opposition whilst you're attacking. That's how you become, you know, a, a good attacking team. So I know I've said two things there, but I couldn't just say one. Well, let that slide. That's all right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Steve, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that um, for you because I, I didn't grill you enough. I felt like so. If you can only analyze one thing of the opposition, what, what is that one thing? I think Richard's answered the question for me um, in the fact that you know their last third entries, um, which would be key for us with insecure possession, um, and then how the opposition react to the counter-attack, that misplaced pass, they're set up defensively, you know. So for me, it was it's last third entries, but flipping it over had the transition, the regain transition of that, because that will give us our attacking prowess, if you like, to go forward and to score goals. So so it's a it's a different answer, but it's a, it's the same answer. Um, there's there's no real way you can just say, do you know, saying this is we need to focus on this because the game ain't just about this. It's about the whole the whole thing. That's, that's a great point. Having been praised for a good question, I, I can see that was a stupid question now, but uh, <laughs> well, well answered, everyone. Um, so, so, Steve, if I stay with you, um, yep. I'm, I'm really interested in how analysis plays a part in the creation of set pieces and the defending of set pieces. Um Set plays, you know, obviously a, a massive part of the, of the English game. Um, and I think it's really key that that we analyse that as a, as a different. So as a so, so the two games that I watch prior to watching them live, I clip all the set plays anyway. So they go into a separate folder and Richard will probably, and, and Andy will probably understand that it goes into a different folder and that gets sent on to the analysts separately. A live game, I try to do the first corner attackingly and the defensive corner, the first ones, because they could be the only ones you get. So on Saturday, the team I was watching on Saturday didn't have no attacking corners during that game. However, they defended five. Okay, So I try to work on a basis of um, if we're working on the attacking one, I sort of look at their defensive setup first. So I look at, obviously, the goalkeepers behind the ball, who's back, who's on the edge, who's taking. That takes five players out of the equation straight away. So if I work that out, so you think of a live game, got a corner, process clicks in, right, goalkeepers, that's a given. Who's back, who's taking, who's on the edge, how many in the box? 
when I go back to watching the game later in the evening, when I've got home and I've downloaded the game from Huddle, I then analyse that particular corner differently, who blocks, how it was taken, who the targets, was it zonal, was it man markers, was it blockers, you know, and ultimately a corner or a set play goal is usually, it can be bad defending. It's not always something that's been worked on in the training ground. It can also be bad defending. Could the defender attack the ball better for a first contact? Um, could they clear their lines? Did they overplay on second phase? How did they deal with the ball going in the box, then coming back out of the box? So there's all these different things that go through your mind, what you're looking for. Um, so I try to do it as live as I can, but then I've also got the backup of downloading that game that evening, watching it, re-watching it back in the morning, the next morning or that evening, depending where I am in the country. Uh, so I can always get that information through. So analysis of set plays becomes really key for, for, for us as a club. And I think most clubs in, in, in all the divisions will, will look at certain trends of how the ball's delivered, short, long, driven, clipped, in swing, out swing, you know, identify those six, seven details straight away. And, and it's different, it's, it's a little bit easier now with no crowd in because you've not got, got people standing up. Do you know what I mean? So people don't stand up. So you've actually got a clear view of what's actually happening in the game. Do you know what I mean? So you, and the game's a little bit slower now. There's no crowd in there. Do you know what I mean? But you've also got, when you are, the crowd are back in, you know, you've got to be ready. You've got to be poised. You've got to be have your process ready to, right, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And then, but now with all the technology and pl platforms and um, we've got now, we can go back and analyse that particular one of there's a, an inventive one, you know, um, we can go back and have a look at that. So we're prepared, you know, prepared in height, physicality, presence, delivery, and all the things that we need to be prepared for in case that happens in the next game. Awesome. And uh, do you ever, I, I guess the other side is how they, how they defend uh, set pieces so do you ever look at it and go I'll tell you what we need to do we need to do this or, or does that does that then become veering into the subjective stuff and you've got to stick to the objective or exactly it goes straight into that subjective so so what I found out with the managers I work for if they ask for your opinion then give it um, but never offer it up if you're offering it up I think that it goes into subjective uh, realms all the time and I think you expose I think Andy touched on it earlier uh, you expose your football knowledge. You know, you've got to feel comfortable agreeing to disagree, never to sit on the fence, just work off facts because the camera don't lie. So if you're all sitting back watching the game back and you're saying this happened, this happened, and actually that happened and that happened, then you've exposed either you're not watching the game or your knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. There's got to be a process on how you work. So you just work off of objective. So if it's zonal marking, it's zonal marking. It's zonal marking with blockers. It's zonal marking with blockers. If it's two zones and man to man, then it's two zones and man to man. D don't think that you can get away with it just because there's like six six foot three players in the side. Oh, okay, then they went man for man because all big. It doesn't work like that. You have just got to get that factual view straight away. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, guys. Look, that that sort of concludes the the sort of formal questions <laughs> from me. What I'd like to do now is, is firstly open it up to Sean to see if there's any uh, more questions from the audience. And then I, I'm, I'm really happy at this stage if the audience wants to take your camera off and, um, and then if, if, we, if we have a bit of time, we can have open, a few open questions from the audience. But I'd also like Richard, Andy and Steve to, uh, to think of a question um, for, for, for one, one, of, one of the other panellists as well, something that you, you don't want to leave this call without asking. So um, by all means now, um, guys, take your, take your, um, put your camera on if, if you want to, you don't have to, but um, it's a friendly club. So don't worry about what's going on in the background <laughs> within reason should be fine. Um, Sean, um, any, any, any more questions come in since the, the, the first round of questions? Yeah, it's, it's been uh, the best one I've had so far because the other two had no questions at all. So you, you, you scare people. You're a lot is, friendlier this time. This has been really good. Like, so one of the ones that I, I would really like an answer to is um, from Brian again, where he was saying, uh, and your attitude is really important to your success. 
Are there any uh, measures taken to try and uh, summarize somebody's attitude, whether it's a good attitude or a poor attitude to the way they play? Oh, that's a great question. I like that. So I guess we're veering into personality, character, psychology, I suppose. Um, who would, was it directed at? Oh, God, well done, Andy. And Andy, every time, if it's from me. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind so, Andy. I don't <laughs> mind from my point of view. Yeah, go on. Do you want to go first and then? Yeah, I'll have a yeah. Go. So, so I think body language is is key. Um, the young, we're not only looking at a football match; we're looking at the uncontrollables, the weather, the referee, um, coaching instruction, players' instruction, reactions to things they just can't control. So, so I'm going to I'm going to use Saturday as an example where a player is on the ball, it takes too many touches, he loses the ball, then I'm looking for a reaction because that will tell me the mindset of the team to a certain extent. So if he's the sort of type who will lose the ball and his first reaction is to track back in yeah, and, and recover his mistake, then I'm thinking, do you know something, you've got something about you and the mindset of the team is, okay, they're playing for the manager, they're playing for this, etc. Et or on the flip side of that, he loses the ball and stops and then you think okay then and then the team who I'm watching create a chance through his decisions and his reaction so for me to go back to the good attitude bad attitude it's more about body language for when I'm sitting in the stands and seeing how people react to the uncontrollables and I think that, that can be key for your match report because if the team's not went one for three or four games and you're seeing players not put the effort in, then it start, you start to question what was actually going on at, at that club at that particular time. So I think that that's really key for me as well. And that takes a little bit off your Andy, because now you're going to go into the youth department uh, and use that, that good and bad attitude. Yeah, and that, that, that's spot on. Body language is the massive thing. We're huge, huge on transition. And that, exactly what Steve said, that instant reaction in transition both ways as well. It's easy to run to that goal when we're trying to score. It's not so easy to react and go that way when we're trying to defend our own goal. So just body language at all times, even the ones when things aren't going well for them. If you watch, I'm probably a little bit biased here. If you watch Billy Gilmore every time he plays, watch <clears throat> whenever a centre half or anyone's got the ball, he's always got his hand out like this, always asking for the ball. Now, that is a body language thing. What that says about his attitude, it says, go on, I'll be brave. I'm con confident enough to go and get on it all the time. So that, that body language, exactly what Steve says, that's the biggest indicator for, for me as well about good and, and bad attitude. So would you say from, from both your author, there's no uh, particular measures. It's just what you see. So it's quite, it is quite subjective, that one. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. Again, that <coughs> subjective is, and I still touched on it again, it's your football knowledge. You have to use your football knowledge and understand the, use your game understanding to be able to, to form that opinion on it, I think. Richard, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, I mean, um, I was going to almost ask Andy a question in terms of, or a bit of a question in terms of, I bet you've seen a lot of players that have maybe had more talent than others, but haven't made it necessarily as far because of the attitude. I think it's becoming such a, it's, you know, teams are recruiting now and that's a massive part of it, isn't it? In terms of, you know, so we've all, we've all known somebody that had all the talent in the world, but maybe they didn't quite have the right attitude to take them as far as they should have gone. Um, I think it's a massive, massive part of the game and just kind of in a slightly different way to pitch it, if you like. So, um, when we're like presenting information to players, I think it's not necessarily attitude, but it's about knowing that person. So, um, you know, you might understand that one player is really receptive to, um, he's, not really, he's not really great with the video and actually that he learns best just being out on the grass and, and doing it that way. Um, or you might find that a player really likes watching video. And, you know, I think with anything, you just really need to know who you're working with. I think if you understand your your players then you've got a really good chance of getting the best out of them whether that be you know and, and even changing their with that ability to change their behavior so you maybe they might not have a good attitude but okay well as coaches what can we do to change that how might we go about knowing how they learn and understand how might we start planning 
you know, to, ch to potentially change that. You know, you've got a, I think if you understand who you're working with, it just gives you a really good bedrock and foundation in terms of, okay, well, how can we then implement change? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and that, that point that, that you made earlier, I think Valkyrie made it, is knowing exactly what you want from something, but knowing exactly what your players want from something or exactly what your coaches want from something and going back again to those relationships that you build. So <clears throat> if I have a relationship with a coach and I understand that that coach really wants me to, to be on the front foot with bringing stuff to him, I need to be more like that. If I've got a coach that he, he, he will ask the questions... And, and ask me to go and find out the answers to those, I probably won't be as on the front foot with, with that sort of stuff. So again, it always comes back to what do you need to know? What do you want to know? Thank you, guys. That was a good question, John. It's, it's obviously important but difficult to uh, observe objectively. So I think that's probably behind the question. So interesting around body language, reacting yeah. to transitions, maybe even what they do in warm-ups and stuff like that. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, Drew's pulled rank and demanded that he can ask a question. <laughs> Go for it, Drew. Uh, no, it's, so based off what you know, I said, so Richard, you were like in first team analysis. Sandy, you're in the youth space. Steve, I think you said before you were, you went across from like coaching to or youth space into analysis into scouting. So my question, I guess, is like, is youth analysis kind of its own thing, or do people kind of work their way from youth to senior? Is senior its own bit? I mean, like within coaching, you've got people that are trying to sort of I guess, go up like a pathway from maybe foundation phase, youth phase, senior, and then others that see themselves as a, a specialist youth coach or a specialist senior coach. So I guess within your um, sort of different roles, but is, is, it, is there a pathway or is it kind of just what does the person do or a uh, bit of a mixed up question there, but there we go. Have a, have a go at it. Yeah, go on. I'll, I'll start as a 50 if you want, guys. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, it, again, it goes completely down to that to that individual in terms of what they want their um, career path to look like. You know, you've got some people that, uh, that absolutely love working with development and youth players, and, you know, that that really suits what they are as a, as a coach, as an analyst, or whatever they are, you know, and I think they're happy to, to stay in that environment. You've got other people that, that strive to want to be in, in a first-team environment, and, you know, I've seen many, many analysts move from academy positions into you know into first team positions so um i personally obviously because i've worked in the first team and, I, and it's the environment i like to work in i quite like that uh, clubs offer pathways for analysts to progress and, and and you know move up the ladder as it were um because i think as well what you can learn in in youth analysis can give you a bit of a different perspective uh, before you go up into first team as well um, so yeah, I personally really like having that option for there to be a ladder and, you know, for, for analysts to move up. But at the same point, I think there's some people that are really suited to working with developing players and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with staying, you know, working in the youth department. <clears throat> yeah, from, from, from my point of view, the, point scouting, of view the, the scouting side of things is always um, the pathway... I think Richard Richard touched on it a little bit. I think you get youth scouts and then you get senior scouts and then you get opposition scouts. So that opposition scout is usually someone who's come through a player coaching, coach management, like department side of things, uh, who's got a good relationship with, with a first team manager. And he usually follows him around because he can trust what he's going to do. He's, he's low maintenance to manage. Um, his knowledge of that league and the players around it will, will help him. So <clears throat> it's very difficult to go from a youth scout into, into, say, to my role. But you can go from youth scout maybe into a first team scout. But then first team scouts could be a specialist in under 23s and under 18s because then we're looking for that, that pathway there. Um, and then you got into the first senior, into senior scouting, which can cover the whole lot, which can cover first team scouting, under 23s and under 18s, especially now with lockdown and stuff like that. People are being more mindset towards watching videos. So they can't go to games. So now they're looking at the academy side of things. They're looking at under 23s and also looking at first team football. I don't know many people who have done the jump to the pigeonhole job of the opposition scouting 
I think that comes down literally to to how the manager feels if he needs that or wants that. Um, you know, if you look at the top two divisions over in over in England, I, I don't think there's that many of us. I think a lot of it's done off of off of data um, and off of video and or sports code and huddle, which I, I totally get. But then some managers like someone to be at the game because you get a different feel for the for the game when you're actually there. There's stuff you can see, there's stuff you can react to, et cetera, et cetera. So the pathway is definitely different. Um, I know Richard's right. There is there is people with a pathway from youth analysis into first team analysis. The same as there is a pathway into from youth scouting into first team scouting. But I'm not sure about the next jump into the opposition stuff so so this is a it's an interesting topic um because scouting is quite close i've been doing it longer i've been scouting longer than i actually did coaching so now i've sort of flipped over a little bit and said you know there's a there's definitely a role for that match day scout and at the moment there's not many out there sean i'm conscious of everybody's time and I, I definitely want um, Andy, Steve and Richard to be able to ask a question but I reckon we might be able to get one more question in from the audience if um, if you think there's there's one in there that will uh, that will help. Yeah definitely I think there's one here from Tony that I think a lot of people would like an answer to and that's uh, any tips from, from you fellas there on how you'd use analysis in I think for grassroots coach development so personal development for a coach how they would use some tips for them to use analysis to improve themselves as a coach. So, so is that different to the question we asked earlier, Sean, about how they would use analysis? This is particularly about developing themselves as a coach rather than improving their player, the team. The, okay. Yeah, that's the way I got it. It was more for them improving yourself as a coach. Okay. <clears throat> um, we, we do a little bit of this as well. I've actually done it, done it myself. So whenever I can, I'll, I'll make sure sessions that, that I'm coaching a, a film. You don't necessarily need to do that. But one of the things that I'm working on at the minute is ball rolling time. Now, what I mean by that is how, how long the ball is actually rolling or in play during a session. So I'm trying to work on my interventions <clears throat> at the moment and making sure that they're, they're shorter and really, really effective. So one of the ways that I do that is just by using my watch. Every time I go in for an intervention, I'll just start my stopwatch and stop it. Time each one maybe take an average for this session. And the other thing I'm doing as well is on my phone, I've got voice notes. So I'll just record the whole session <clears throat> um, and every intervention, I'll listen back to it as well. I think, am I being too wordy? Am I just just talking for too long? Did I actually get the point out that I wanted to, to get out? So there's loads of little simple things you, you can do. It's just, <laughs> again, probably sounding like a little bit of a broken record here, but knowing exactly what you want and then figuring out the way that you're going to get the answers to that. So whatever it is, there's there's nothing too simple or nothing that isn't worth doing. A lot of the best ideas we've we've had as, as a department have come from pretty bad ideas, to be fair. And when we sat down and spoke about it afterwards and said, why on earth are we doing that? But from that comes the, the good idea and the, not revolutionary, but the ones that take you on to the next step. Because yeah, my mind went straight to video, and you you use the example of stopwatch and uh, so that, that's great. Because yeah, analysis you know isn't just obviously the, the, the video. So thank you for that. Um, right, I I think I'd like uh, Steve, Richard, or or Andy to jump in and ask um, one or the other uh, a question. Andy's taken a bit of a, a battering, but we, we, it doesn't mean we'll go easy on him. Um, Steve, uh, have you got a, a question for either Richard or, or Andy? Yeah, I've got a question for Richard. Um, how much information do you take from your opposition scout, if you have one, um, to plan your clips that you're going to show first team management and players? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we, we haven't got an opposition, uh, an opposition scout. That's me. So, um, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm responsible for creating all of the opposition work um, at Anderlecht. So, I mean, I guess there's um, an important thing for me is, and especially because of the way we're playing in Belgium is, is quite different to a lot of the other teams. So just a couple of key bits of information that I always work towards. So, 
there's there's only a couple of teams in the league that are playing our formation at the moment. So a lot of teams uh, this year seem to be playing a back five, which we don't. So when I'm watching games, I will I will often try and watch the teams that are playing a similar shape to us um, as a one point of view. And then also because of the way we play, that's again quite different to everybody else. I will always try and focus a lot on what happened last time we played them. Um, watching that last game that we played against that opponent is is really important from my point of view because teams are often setting up a little bit differently um, to how they normally would. Um, obviously, that's not always possible because managers change and and all that type of thing. But yeah, um, trying to you know sometimes uh, in Belgium you've got. Uh, teams that are playing with completely different styles to us. So from my point of view, for me to analyse that game of, of two teams that don't play anything like us, it doesn't give us that much information. Thank you, Richard. Um, right, you can return the favour or go over to Andy, Richard. Have you got a, a yeah, question? Yeah, to be fair, I, I will return the favour, um, Steve. So obviously it sounds like you've worked under um, a fair few managers in the time. I just wondered, obviously, you've just literally gone through another change. How much yeah. um, changes instantly or, you know, per when the new manager comes in or is it more that it kind of it stays consistent to start with and then as that relationship builds that things change a bit over time? Yes, yeah, so my previous club, I, I stayed on over the manager change for about four to five weeks. Uh, and, and there was just, it just started to change um, towards another way of working, like a different template, um, different clips that we would show, et cetera, and stuff like that. Then when I moved to the, my present club, went, went, sort of went straight in and picked up the baton from where I'd sort of left off before the previous manager had left because that's I know that he that he wants. <clears throat> Obviously, we're just going through that change again. And for the last like 10, 11 days, nothing's really changed. Um, whether or not that'll change over the next 10 days, I, I'm not too sure. But as I think it's I've had a good conversations within the management staff. Uh, they seem quite happy about how we prep for for the opposition. So Sometimes if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So let's see how that progresses over the next 10 days or two weeks, you know, and that might be results based, you know, you, you know, yourself, if you, we've, we've had a couple of good results, but if we then go on a, a bad run, then the manager might start to look at things. Well, we're not really given that information or we're not getting that information. So, okay, Jonesy, can you adapt it? Can we take this information? Can you look for that now? So, so I'll be uh, along those lines. I would have thought so. But that's how it probably has changed uh, over the past like two or three seasons. Andy, you've got off the hook, so uh, you can ask the, the the final question of the evening in relaxed style. Okay, it, it's it's probably a question for both of you because I know you both work within academy football. And, and going back to the question before about the pathway stuff, obviously that's something that really interests me as well. I don't know whether I do want to go to first team football yet. I don't know whether that I'd be able to anyway. Um, but one of the things I really, really love about this job is affecting change or affecting players. One of the concerns I'd have is when I go to first team football is how much am I actually affecting players anymore? So it's probably a, a question for both of you. And do, you. do you still feel that you are affecting players at, at a first team level? Is it a lot more about the team? It's probably a, an obvious answer there, but. And I'd quite like to know. I think it, um, I personally think it massively depends on the manager you're working under, to be honest. Um, and obviously, you know, and the resources you've got available. So now at Anderlecht, um, we've got a really young team. I mean, we have, I think our average age starting age is 21. I think we've got the, the fourth or fifth youngest starting age in Europe um, at the moment. So we've obviously got a lot of young guys that are playing in the first team anyway. Um and obviously these guys have been brought up on analysis and, you know, they're really receptive to it. And I think the, the beauty of your skill set would be that you could almost um, work in, in a club like that. You could go in and, you know, you could start to do some individual sessions with players on the, on the grass because you've got that coaching background anyway. So all of a sudden then that kind of coach analyst role, which is becoming a lot more prevalent now across the game, I think your skill set would ne naturally lend itself to that. Um, mm. And I think sometimes, you know, 
I, I guess it will be the same at Chelsea in terms of their first team analyst department. They've probably got uh, it's, it's well resourced, I would imagine. Um, mm. And sometimes, as you say, I guess as you work in at the very, very top level, you might actually end up being indirectly a little bit further away in terms of you know you being the one who can get out on the grass or do something or lead a meeting. Um, but again, it all comes down to the manager in terms of you know if they if they trust you and you know you can do a good job for them. What you know the the exposure they're willing to give you, sort of thing. Spot on. Yeah, I sort of sort of agree with Richard there. I think it's uh, th that role is becoming more interactive um, with the analyst being even down onto the bench now. So you sort of get an mm -hmm. analyst, you know, doing the uh, the video work. Then you also get the um, the analyst down on the bench because you can have an iPad down on the bench and that you can get that reaction and that replay straight away. So and then that puts you in direct contact with players. Players will come and ask you, and they go back to that football knowledge. So and then they become to trust you, and then you can start to work with players. Whether or not you get your boots on and go on the grass, that's probably completely different, you know, because that's down to the first team staff and their coaching team. Mm. But pathway for for analysts is, is quite good, and, and you, like Richard said, it's, it's definitely changing. For that, I can see my role changing as into more of an interactive scout, where I can watch the opposition during the week, a bit like Richard does. I can still clip. I can still put the video together with the analysts and then maybe there'd be the eye in the sky where I've got a coaching background where I can relay the messages down uh, and be a bit more interactive that way, you know, especially with lockdown and how things are going to look when we do come out of lockdown into stadiums, you know, I think the days where there's 30, 40,000 people in a stadium is going to look a lot different in August, you know, and, when, and when's that going to change? So I think it's been a good way of, of finding different ways of working um, and meeting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and stuff like that. So, I f there, there is a pathway. How it's going to look, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. In two or three years' time. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much, Drew. I'm very conscious that um, um, I'm going to might be asking you to do a a summary. <coughs> three points last time. I don't know if you can make it two points this time. You see, so you've done the the, the mute thing. There you go. You could have just not gone to me, but here we go. It's it's still three, but they're, they're even shorter. Right. The context and environment are key. So ultimately it depends. The process is key. So just keep it simple and be objective and offer your opinion when asked. Nice. That is uh, that is uh, succinct. Thank you, Drew. No, I just want to tie up a couple of loose ends before I, I say thank you to, to everybody. So, um, Firstly, we are we're taking a week off next week. I know we've only been back for two, <laughs> but we're taking a week off uh, next week, and we're hoping that we're back on the fifteenth of February with another Monday Night Coaches Club. But of course, I will I will let everybody know uh, the details of that when they're finalised. And I'd also like to say thank you very much to the Professional Football Scouts Association, um, who um, I think Steve and, and Richard do some some work for on their on their education um courses as well so um if you want to hear more from steve and richard um then then um and, or just want to know more about the sort of stuff that we've touched upon in terms of talent identification opposition analysis scouting and performance analysis then then i thoroughly recommend um, those courses for you so thank you very much to the professional football scouts association for that and all that leaves me to do is to, to thank Sean and Drew for um, making it be uh, fairly smooth, I think. I think we can claim it was fairly smooth tonight. We won't say it was very smooth, but I think it was fairly smooth tonight. So thank you to, to Drew and Sean for, for your time. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, as always, for the coaches that have joined um, us tonight. It's 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 great that um, um, I think there's... a. Uh, Andy said at the beginning that, that we have so many open people who are prepared to invest in themselves and, and give up their time to to find out more about certainly a, a part of football that, that, that I didn't know so much about. So um, thank you very much to the coaches. Um, and obviously, thank you very much to our panellists for themselves being so open and, and sharing and giving us an insight into their world, but also giving us some advice that I think we can definitely take away and apply with our own players and teams. So... Richard, Steve and Andy, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it.
Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Lovely. Well, look, everybody have a, have a great morning, evening, afternoon, whatever it might be. Um, and um, thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks time. Thanks very much, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.